<laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to Pizza Bones. You can eat that crust productions, proud members of the You Run Podcast Network. You can find our show and all the other shows on yourunpodcast.com. Tonight we're going to be discussing Edmund Kemper. My name is Greg Hoey. With me is Seamus Rogers, of course, and Nate Harvey. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing well. What up, guys? Doing good. Hey, hey, everyone. Glad I can join you guys for this one. Hell yeah. yeah. Happy to have you. I, I'm coming in lazy, though. I didn't do any research. That's that's my gig right there. That's what I do. <laughs> I, I barely remember his case, but I'm sure that you guys will. Uh, I'm sure some will start coming back to me. I, yeah, it's like riding a bike. I remember him being a gold star, I think. Oh, yeah, he's a gold and a, star. And a bit of a bumble butt. He's a bit of a bumble butt. <laughs> Got the, the big old butt. Yeah, that's what he said to, about talking to women. He's like, I couldn't talk to women. I was a bit of a bumble butt. <laughs> a bumble butt. All right. So, like I said, we're talking about Edmund Kemper, six foot nine, three hundred plus pounds, co-ed killer, freaking wrestler. Yeah, should have been a basketball player. Right, that's Shaq size right there. Right, it's terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> the gentle yeah. giant. Actually, you want to know what's really terrifying is I, <laughs> I think he was born thirteen pounds, oh. and uh, average <laughs> average baby is eight. So, Damn. Um, terrifying is being the one person that gave birth to that baby. Oh yeah, he always, he's abused women his whole life. What? Well, not, you know. not just because of what he turned into, <laughs> but the way he came out, thirteen pounds. Exactly. And that big old bumble butt. <laughs> yeah, big old bumble butt coming out your vagina. Uh, Fucking wrecked it. The baby's Gone. butt is stuck in, in the womb. <laughs> <laughs> we got him out. His head's crowning, but his butt is stuck. <laughs> Oh God! So Kepper was born on December eighteenth, nineteen forty-eight, Burbank, California. He was the middle child of Edmund Emil Junior Kemper and Clarnell Kemper. Clarnell, and Clarnell is a beaut. Clarnell's his mom. Yeah, and so his dad, Edmund Emil, was six eight, and Clarnell was six feet. Jeez, so, big parents. Big, big parents. Do bumble butts run in the family? <laughs> they do. It's a big bumble butt family. <laughs> <laughs> After his parents divorced in 1957, he moved with his mother and two sisters to Montana. Kemper had a difficult relationship with his alcoholic mother as she was very critical of him. Always blamed her for all his problems. Always knocking stuff over with that bumble butt, damn you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she basically disliked him because he reminded of her of the father and she hated the father, obviously, because they get divorced. It's a tough situation there. Yeah. So when he was 10 years old, she forced him to live in the basement. I'd hate him because he's a monster. She, maybe she knew something. Maybe she sensed things. She could sense it. Yeah. Did she ever say why she put him in the basement? Because I heard contradicting statements on that. Yeah. And a lot of these, a lot of this stuff is coming from Edmund Kemper himself. So mm -hmm. like most of the information comes from Edmund. This isn't the guy that was like a cobbler. His family wasn't no. no. That would make it that much better. That's Joseph Callinger. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that guy was fucked up, and maybe we'll cover him eventually as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so no, they forced him in the basement because his mom was scared of him like raping his sisters or hurting his sisters. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's what I heard. Yeah. They would leave him in the basement all day and he just had like a hanging light, and they would let him up for supper. Like you they had to move the table. And, huh. they, and and there was like a trap door. So like basically they would move the table and let him out of the basement. Damn. Did they give him any livestock to abuse? Well, he, was... well, he did kill a cat downstairs. Of course, like like most serial killers, he, he killed a cat and cut its head off, stuck it on a stick. Yeah, poor cats, man. They, they're always building blocks of serial killers' uh, resume, huh? <laughs> yeah, and, and they say actually that uh, a lot of people who kill females – Start off by killing cats because cats are like a feminine symbol. Hmm. Yeah, BTK said similar stuff. Yep. It did say his mom was, was in love with those cats, right? Yeah, and, and, and again, also, cat fan. cats are also, um, you know, they're very choosy of who they give their attention to. It's not like a dog that's going to love you no matter what, like a right. cat. So he was pretty pissed off about that as well. 
when uh, we were looking for a house, we like to, to go with like old condemned houses that are just pieces of shit and need work. So one of these houses, we walked in and uh, I'm looking around and on the water heater, there was like four cat skulls. Jesus. Wow. Just just sitting just just right out there in the open. So I'm wondering, you know, what serial killer is around here? Satanic rituals going on in the house. I'm so excited about cat skulls. One day, Mrs. Uh, Mittens found her way down in the basement. This was his mom's favorite cat. And he just, I'll show you, mom. Yeah, he sure <laughs> showed her. Yeah, you talk about that, Nate, too. You also have serial killers. <laughs> Not serial killers, but yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> you know, true. Shame. Instead, there's a Mount Vernon killing like right down the street from Nate. I don't know if you remember those kids that just randomly broke into these people's houses and like stabbed the mother and stabbed the daughter and the daughter like survived. Yeah. Fucking it's crazy story. Slit her throat. And it's a mess. Yeah. Is that these psychos? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yep. The next day, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. They're, teenagers. They're dumb, yeah. They're dumb teenagers, but it was gruesome gruesome crime i remember hearing about it on the radio sports talk radio actually but when <laughs> nate sent me that link i was like holy shit that happened down the street from your house that's fucking madness oh yeah we could walk there well i'm glad they got them off the streets because they probably wouldn't have stopped there no so kemper had a dark fantasy life early on like sometimes about dreaming of about killing his mother he cut off the heads of his sister's dolls and coerced the girls into playing a game he called gas chamber in which his sister would bl- blindfold him and tie him to a chair, and he would tend to writhe in agony until he died from gas. So he's not <laughs> holding them under a blanket and just farting on their faces. No, it's getting uh, it's getting crazy. Well, he did roll them up in uh, in rugs though, and see how fast they could get out. Well, he was practicing for his future hookers. And you wonder why his mom wanted to keep the kids away or keep mm-hmm. the daughters away. And like I said, his first victim was the family cats. Did I say cats? Poor Miss Mittens. Yeah, so at 10, he buried one of them alive. And the second, at 13 year old, he slaughtered it with a knife and basically like chopped its skull off until the brain was showing. And let it dry out on the heater? Yeah, he let it like just like kibby out. Like it was just... No. It was like, oh, I hate animal torture anyway, obviously. <laughs> mm-hmm. I just don't understand torture in general. It's just yeah. it's such an inhumane thing. It's disgusting. I don't know how you could stomach it. <laughs> yep, people are fucked up. That's why we have True Crime Podcasts. So he went to live with his father for a time, but ended up back with his mother, who decided to send the troubled teenager to live with his grandparents in North Folk, California. North Fork, California. Edmund Kemper was a, a Boy Scout, loved guns. His grandparents gave him a twenty-two. Big mistake. Yep. And uh, he hated living with his grandparents. He hated living on the farm. His grandmother like wrote children's books or illustrated children's books. I feel like every serial killer lived on a farm. Right? Yeah, that's a lot of idle time to and a lot of space to do crazy shit. All right, get these kids some friends. So his grandparents took away his rifle after he killed several birds and other small animals. And uh, his grandmother had a gun in her, like, underwear drawer. And, like, when she was in the bathroom, he would, like, take it out and, like, play with it and, like, dance around with it and, like, suck, pretty... on, it, suck on the muzzle. Yeah, I do all sorts of weird shit with it. And basically, when she left, she would take the gun with her. And he would be like, Grandma, why? Are you, what are you doing? Why are you taking the gun? Did you take that gun with you? Like, Because he was like, why wouldn't she trust me? Oh, well, then she like, well, how do you know I have the gun? Right? Oh, she, oh, he knew. August 27th, 1964, Kemper just walked into the kitchen when his grandmother was re- uh, viewing one of the children's books she wrote and shot her in the back of the head. Oh, he's an angry dude. His grandfather pulls up and, like, you know, waves at him, smiles at him, goes around the back, shoots him in the car. And the reason he shot the grandfather is because he didn't want the grandfather to have to witness seeing his wife dead. He was doing him a favor. Wow, what a what a gentleman he is. Right? Yeah, he sound, it's not, he's def, clearly the uh, poster child for empathy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he he does that a lot where he's like, oh... And this happened because of they did this or like he's always he's never taking responsibility. Yes, he's never taking responsibility. He's always passing the blame on on the victims as well. He's she made fun of my bumble butt. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, he'd be killing the whole world. That was the case. Dude's got like that butt like the guy on Instagram. They always chase around. You know, that guy, (laughs) he's got the big butt. He's always like skateboarding or they're like chasing him around. 
He's always wearing khakis. I don't know if you know that guy. Oh, uh, yeah. My buddy just uh, just posted a picture with that guy. Actually, nice. This guy's got a sweet mustache. <laughs> I I didn't know he was a thing. Huh. Oh yeah, he's a thing. He's always he's got a big butt. He's got a big bumble butt, and they chase yeah. him around. Oh, oh, it's huge. It's yeah. yeah, it's ridiculous. Huge. I don't know what he was doing, but yeah, my my buddy just saw him. Probably something with his butt. Like, hey, can I sign your butt? Huh. I mean, we should have definitely went into this episode with a drinking game on the word butt. Starting now, anytime you hear the word butt or bumble butt, take a <laughs> shot. <laughs> take a shot. So after he did the deed, he called his mother, who then told him to call the police and tell them what happened. Later, like I said, later, Kemper would say that he shot his grandmother to see what it felt like. I assume he didn't do that. What? Called this, called the police? Oh, he did. That's a, that's not like, you know, I don't want to get, actually, I won't get too out of myself, but no, he t- he totally did that. And he told them it was him? Yep. He said he shot it. He shot his grandmother. Like I said, later he would say that he shot his grandmother to see what it felt like. He added that he killed his grandfather so the man wouldn't have to find out about his wife being murdered. And so the cops are just like, well, I think he's he, he's had enough punishment. He's got to live with this. We'll just set him free. Well, keep in mind, he's 13 years old right now as well. Yes. Yeah. At least he's honest. So for his crimes, Kemper was handed over to the California Youth Authority. He underwent a, a variety of tests, which determined they had a very high Q, which was, any guesses? 148. Nate? 160. 140. You're both wrong! Or he suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. And that, that's where he got diagnosed. So yes. right, that was probably his defense? Uh, potentially. So he was eventually sent to... He's not going to blame it on himself. He's going to blame it on... It was Damien. He told me to do it. Well, no, he just, he basically admitted it. And like, I get you're 13, so you're not going to get, you know, you're obviously not getting tried as an adult. You know, they're not going to put you away for life for this, even though maybe they. I'll tell them later on when they call them. Oh, gotcha. Yep. Probably should have. So he was sent to Estrado State Hospital, a maximum security facility for the mentally ill. Like youth? Yes. There was 1,600 uh, patients there. Like over a dozen murderers and rapists. So basically he was living with murderers and rapists. 1,600 patients. There was only a staff of 10. Sounds like. Oh, God. I mean, that sounds like shit went wrong. It'd be like rapture. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Surprised they didn't like, you know, overrun the facility. So he spent five years there and he gained the trust of all the staff. Because again, like he had a very high IQ. He befriended a psychiatrist and he would like run errands for him. So he had access to like over hundreds of case studies that went to like grisly details, including like what to say to psychiatrists. These are his, his uh, edition of fantasy novels or rom- romantic exactly. novels. Well, this is his training. This is where he learned all his things, what to do and what not to do as far as being a killer. It's the academy for killing. But like I said, he got to the idea of what to say to psychiatrists for people who are sane and people who are insane. He's in there with rapists. He's in there with murderers. Well. He belongs there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 1969, Kemper was released at the age of 21. And despite his prison doctor's record. For like seven, eight years? He was there for five years. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're right. So, so he, was that, he was at that place for five years, but he was like locked away for a total of like eight years. Did his parents visit him or anything? I don't think so. His mom fucking hated him. It is, and you'll f- come to find out his dad wasn't a huge fan either, though he loved his dad. He was obsessed with his dad. He thought his dad loved him, but we'll uh, get to that soon. So he was released at the age of 21. And like I said, despite his prison doctor's recommendations that said, do not put him with his mother because of her past abuse and her psychological issues, he rejoined her in Santa, C- Santa Cruz, California, where Perfect. she had just ended her third marriage to take a job at the University of California. If only people would listen to their doctors. Right. And all live healthier lifestyles. So while there, Kemper attended community college for a time and worked a variety of jobs, eventually finding employment with the Department of Transportation in 1971. But of course, his mom blamed him for everything. She's like, I haven't got laid in 10 years because of you, because you're a killer. Constantly just saying that you're a loser, you're broken, nobody trusts you. No, like positive reinforcement is very important for children. I, I know. I didn't get a lot of it when I was younger, so. But you overcame. Yeah, I, I didn't kill any cats. No cats? No? Not yet. So he was obsessed with being a cop. So he, he applied to be, become a state trooper. 
but he was rejected because of his size and his bumble butt. You can't get out of the squad car. <laughs> How are you going to get out of the squad car with that bumble butt? You can't. Like I said, he weighed around 300 pounds and was six feet, nine inches tall. Your partner would have to sit in the back. <laughs> right? Like w- <laughs> w- w- with the with the convict. Your bumble butt spilling over into my seat. And the thing is, he was obsessed with, he wanted to be a chips cop. He want, which is the, was ride the, a motorcycle. Yeah, the motorcycle cop. Yeah, and he was way too big for that as well, too. So he had a nickname, Big Ed. So he hung around with some of the police officers. He would go to this bar called the Jury Room, and one of them actually gave him a school badge and handcuffs. Nice. While another let him borrow a gun. Yeah. Smart. He seems smart like guy. an alright kid. Yeah. Sure, you can borrow my gun. Yeah. Give him a gun. Give him a gun. Give him a badge. Just don't shoot it. Remember, you're not a real cop. Just you have to only pretend. Brandish it around, get what you want, you know, with it. But just don't fire it off. He also had a car that resembled the police cruiser, which was a yellow Ford Galaxy, which he got after he got in an accident with his motorcycle and was awarded a fifteen thousand dollar settlement in a civil suit filed against the car's driver. So would you say he was born in what, ninety forty eight, forty three? What was it? Yeah, nineteen forty eight. This is like 69 or something like that. This is 71. This is 71 71 right now. Yeah. Okay. So imagine like what he could have done as a cop, the evil things he could have done as a police officer with the authority of a badge. With the protection of being a god, yeah. Now, when he got into the motorcycle crash, he hit his head, right? He did hit his head. And that's like a triad of serial killers. Is that part? Exactly. Let's go back. He must have hit his head sooner. Yeah, right. But isn't there a hiatus between when he was younger and uh, and as an adult killing? Oh yeah, for sure. Like he killed his grandparents. He killed his grandparents in sixty nine or in. Blah, blah, blah. Do you think his mom ever felt guilty about that? May yeah, no. probably not. She was a bitch. <laughs> Basically, got them killed by putting giving your son away to them. Yeah, and so sixty four, he killed his oh, grandparents, yeah. and like he's seventy one, and he's out yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, so he got he got his head injury, which is like kind of like I said, you know, child abuse, sexual abuse, hitting and getting head injuries. A lot of serial killers have this shit because obviously head injuries are fucking horrible. And he did buy that yellow Ford Galaxy with that money he got. Aaron Hernandez, you know, with the the CTE and there's at his age, remember, you know, I was listening to the Death and Entertainment and you're talking about it. And yeah, it's crazy. He, they said that he's the worst case they've ever seen at that age, like. People 20 years old, older don't even have it so bad when he was 27. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I guarantee that played a huge fucking part in it. <laughs> How could it not? You know, you're when you have CTE, you are gone. Like, they show um, who's the dude who plays for the Steelers or played for the Steelers who got, na- like, the wide receiver who's crazy, like, ran off this. It was Antonio Brown. Yeah, he's loopy. Yeah, he's loopy. And they showed, like, interviews with him before, before he, like, got all those crazy hits. And he seemed like almost like a normal guy, like. Yeah, it's sad. He's it's like, insane. yeah, he's completely insane. It is. It is sad. Like that's why I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm pissed. I played football and semi-pro football at that. I mean, at least they get headway with you know much better helmets nowadays. But yeah, these kids putting them through that. What he was put through too. But anyways, like I said, he was a, he was a cop groupie. That's what they called them. Uh-huh. Um, so unable to work, he turned his mind towards other pursuits. This is the hippie movement. Couldn't and join the force, but he could blow the force. He, he can. This is a hippie movement, and he missed, you know, he basically missed his adolescence, and, like, he missed this whole hippie movement, so everything's kind of crazy to him. He doesn't know how to talk to girls. He's noticing a large number of young women hitchhike in the area, and uh, so with a new car that he bought with the settlement money, he started to store tools in his car that he might need to fulfill his murderous desires, including a gun, a knife, handcuffs. He was like practicing. He was planning. Yes. And he was practicing. Like he, he was basically like, I can't just get all excited and blow my like, Oh my God, jump in my car. So he would pretend like he would pull up and be like, Oh, I uh, check his watch and be like, huh? I don't know. I guess I can bring you yeah, like with his IQ. He's smart enough to tell people what they want to hear and probably put people at ease, even though he's a massive giant. Exactly. And he would practice that. And like, so he had a four door or I'm sorry, a two door car. It was like a coupe. And he had this little trick where he would like kind of lean in, open the door, and then he would like drop his like chapstick in between like some part of the door to allow them not to open the door from that side. 
So he would like kind of practice that just like he would practice pulling his gun. Like he was just, he did a lot of, he picked up a lot of girls hitchhiking and did not do anything to him. Like he just safely gave him rides, talking to him, learning. Oh, chickened out a lot in the beginning, you know. Totally. But like I said, he was also just kind of learning and practicing to eventually lead up to what, you know, he was going to do. So like I said, after, at first Kimper would pick up hit female hitchhikers and let them go. However, when he offered a ride to two Friends of State students, Mary Ann Pessy and Anita Lushi, Lusha, I'm sure I'm butchering those names. In fact, I know I'm butchering those names. <laughs> they would never make it to their destination. On August 15th, when a female head was discovered in the woods near Santa Cruz and was later identified as Pessy's, Lucia's remains, however, were never found. So Kemper later explained that he stabbed and strangled PC before stabbing Lucia as well. I feel like I said those names like different every time. <laughs> what a bumble butt. So he, yeah, during that crime, he said, you know, watching all these movies, you think when you stab somebody. You didn't expect as much blood, right? Yeah. He found a secluded spot, drew his gun out of him and put one of them in the trunk. Came back. He killed her. But when he stabbed her, he's like, he expected her to like just die. And he's like, you know, when you stab somebody, they don't die. He's like, they leak. <laughs> they leak. Yeah, that was a quote. Yep. Oh, yeah. And he's like, he's like, they leak to death. He's like, depending on where you stab them. He's like, it's his heart. He's like, I stabbed her a bunch of times. He's like, she turned around. I couldn't stab her in the heart because her breast was there. And it made me embarrassed. He's like, I was embarrassed. He's like, I probably said that. I was embarrassed to stab her in the breast. <laughs> he wanted to save him for later. I don't think he was a breast man, though. Oh, just do you cut the vagina out? Oh, he's more of a head <laughs> guy. <laughs> but yeah, let's, definitely. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> hey, oh. But yeah, so after he killed her in the trunk, he came up to the front seat and basically was like, hey, your friend needs help. You know, come come back here. And he basically stabbed her and leaked her to death as well, too. But it was a thing where basically he said he was thinking they were going to die so easy and ended up stabbing him so many times. And he was so panicked that he started to run away from his car after the, after he committed the crimes and he, his gun fell down his pants and he tripped on his gun and fell. And then like, cause he totally forgot he had a gun to shoot him. Still going to leak. <laughs> so he brought up, he brought the bodies back to his apartment and this is where he, he had a roommate at the time as well too. He's not living with his mom at this time. He's got his own place and got a roommate. Apparently the roommate wasn't there, but he removed their heads and hands and reportedly engage in sexual activity with their corpses. He liked to fuck their heads. Mm -hmm. Like the mouth or the stump? The mouth. Well, I'm, both, right? Yeah, I'm sure he would fuck the, the stumps <laughs> as well, too. The stump comes, comes later on in the story, I believe. Yes. And he would bury these body parts in different places. Like I said, he, was, he learned a lot at the psychiatric place. So later that year, September 14th, 1972, Kemper picked up 15-year-old... Akeo Ku, who decided to hitchhike rather than wait for the bus to take her dance class. This one's pretty tragic. Uh, this girl was a dancer and she really wanted to go to this dance recital thing. And her mom basically was like, yeah, if you take the bus, don't hitchhike. Because, you know, hitchhiking is known. Parents know their kids are hitchhiking. It's, it's the 70s. It's, it's new. Hitchhiking is safe, everybody. <laughs> so she missed the bus and then Kemper was there and he picked her up. So this girl, he pulled a gun on her right away and she was super scared and he got out of the car with a gun on the seat and locked himself out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a bumble butt. She lets him back in. Oh my. And she would take the, she would face the same fate as Pessy and uh, Lucia. Why the heck would you unlock the door for him? Like she could have grabbed the gun. She, I mean, she's, she's 15 this years old. She's a scary like girl. Pulp Fiction, guy leaves his gun on the toilet, leaves it in your car seat, I'd be shooting you with it. Yeah, right? That's a Bruce Willis reference. In January 1973, Kemper continued to act on his murderous impulses, picking up hitchhiker Cindy Shaw, whom he shot and killed. By the way, he's back living with his mom. Oof. What happened between him and his roommate? He just decided to move back in with his mom. Like, I don't know why, why he would do that, because they have like a love-hate relationship. I think he just wants to be wanted. I did leave out that when he was 21, he did try to go back and live with his dad because he was obsessed with his dad. And the, the stepmom was like, got a headache anytime he like spoke. <laughs> she hated him. Yeah. And she's like, your kid's fucking weird. Get him the fuck out of here. I also heard uh, his dad, his dad was like talking about how bad the mom actually was. And he's like, he's like, it was easier in World War II than it was to live with his mom. Oh, true. 
Yeah. That's how miserable of a person she was. Yeah. Well, she did, you know, I mean, honestly, it's no excuse. I mean, but you, you feel bad for his childhood. Like kid was fucked from the start. Yeah. It's terrible. Just cause she doesn't want to be a mom. Well, I guess she, he had a sister or two, right? Yeah. Two sisters. She didn't fuck them up. Yeah, one of his sisters later on the stand would say basically that um, I quote she quoted her brother by saying like I didn't see a girl and like wanted to kiss her I wanted to see a girl and kill her and then kiss her or some weird ass quote like that it's like Jesus Christ that's his sister saying that about him yes and or, and he said this at like seven or eight years old so after he kills Cindy Shaw his mother's out so Kemper goes back to her house hides the body in his room dismembers the corpse, throws all the body parts in the ocean. Several parts were later discovered to wash up on shore, but he buried her head in his mother's backyard and he buried it like right by his window. So he basically could talk to it. (laughs) So where is he dismembering these corpses? In his fucking room. Was he got like a Dexter room going on? I, I no, I don't, I don't think so. I think he's like, I don't think his mom goes in his room. Mom! Meatloaf! <laughs> yeah, because the mom eventually found the kid. When he killed the cats, the second cat he killed, he left in the closet, and the mom, like, found it, but he was able to talk his way out of it. Like, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not insane. Okay, son, nothing to see here, Big Ed, even though I think you're crazy anyway. February 5th, 1973, his mom gave him a campus parking sticker because, like, all, like, girls are going missing, and it, a lot of it's ha- happening on the campus where his mom works, so... They're basically like, don't take a ride from anybody unless they have a campus parking sticker. <laughs> so he's using this to his advantage. So he drove to the university where he had offered a ride to two students, Rosalind Thorpe and Alice Liu. Um, these girls were like studying late and they missed the university bus like by a couple minutes. And he picked them up. He shot the young women and he, he drove by the campus security at the gates with two mortally wounded women in his car and basically just talked <laughs> his way out of it. And like, was like, Oh no, they're passed out or they're, they're sleeping rough night of studying. He was very smart. He was able to talk his way out of a lot of shit. He was better this time. He didn't stab him 20 times. Exactly. He's using the gun instantly. Now in March, some of Thorpe's and Lou's remains were discovered by hikers near highway one in San Mateo County. Also at the time of the murders, there were two other serial killers happening. John Lindley Frazier and Herbert Mullen. Uh, his his friend, Herbert. Yeah, Herbert Mullen, who will he, he would eventually be uh, bunk mate. Not bunk mates. He would be next door to him in, in jail. Next door to him, yeah. yeah. I, I love this part of the story. <laughs> yeah. He basically, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, actually, we can talk about that now. When he's in jail, eventually, he basically trains this guy like a bird because Herbert Mullins would always sing. And basically, Ed Kemper was like, yo, shut the fuck up or I'm going to fucking kill you. And eventually. Big Ed angry. Yeah, eventually Herbert would be like, hey, can I sing now? And he'd be like, yeah, okay. He's in like, basically, Ed, Ed Kemper was like, it was like training a bird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'd give him, he'd give him peanuts yeah. when he's good. And then, uh, and when he was bad, he'd, he'd splash water at him. Uh, <laughs> and, it, cat. and at first he used to, he used to like, he used to be really good at dodging the water. But then, uh, then Edmund got his, uh, got some other people in on it and, uh, and they kind of tracked him in the cell, so he knew exactly where to throw the water. Hold Herman so down. Get him every time. I'm gonna spray, yeah. his, spray his face in water. Yeah. So. Yeah, Herbert. Kind of awesome. Herbert Mullins killed people because that I think he said that California was gonna get sunk in the sea if he didn't do it. It was some like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is his? Is some there some religious. That? Yeah, it was just some religious crazy. He had like some message from God or whatever, like that told him that if he didn't kill that, you know, California was going to like sink into the sea or some crazy shit like that. And then John Lindley Frazier was basically kind of like, or not more so like Manson where he just went to like a house and killed all the people, even though Manson didn't kill people. He told them to, but he didn't really tell them to, I guess. Helter Skelter. Helter Skelter. She spelt it wrong. <laughs> so yeah, it was basically the murder capital of the world. Just like uh, so in the in the show or the movies Lost Boys, you know, I think they referenced so that. He's in Cali now. Yep. So his mom moved to Cali too. You know, this, we've been in Cali for a little while. Yeah. Ever since his, was it his dad in Montana? Yeah, his or? dad was in Montana. No. Yep. Okay. His mom was originally in Montana. They, I mean, they all lived in Montana, but like when he went to his grandparents, he went to California, and then his mom was like mm-hmm. working at the California University. 
So this is all taking place in California. Going hitchhiking Cali. Yeah. Three in the 70s. Moral of the story. Yeah. Don't do it. So Santa Cruz receiving the name murder capital of the world and Kemper would be dubbed the co-ed killer. Co-ed butcher. The bumblebutt butcher. Only kill like college girls. Basically, yes. Or or young women. So far. Yeah, so far, yeah. (laughs) And we're about to get to the big one. 1973 in April, Kemper committed what would be his last two murders. On Good Friday, he went to his mother's home where the two had an unpleasant exchange. That's the thing. Anytime he would kill someone, he would usually have a fight with his mom. Like, So if he had like a big fight with his mom, he would go off and blow steam by killing people. It's too bad he just didn't kill his mom like 15 years ago. Right. So he came into the bed and she was like, I suppose you're going to want to talk all night. And he just said, no. And he went back in his room for four hours, came back in later, shot her. Oh, nope, sorry. Talk to her. I got he- I got heads in the backyard to talk to. Right. <laughs> so he said he went in there and she said, I suppose you want to talk all night. He went to his room for four hours, came back when she was sleeping and smashed her head in with a hammer and then cut her throat with a knife. Oof. So he did, he decapitated her head, cut off her hands, but also removed her larynx and put it. And he tried to stick it down the garbage. Uh, he tried to stick it down the garbage disposal and like kept on like spitting back up at him. <laughs> oh, not talking back now, huh? No so, yeah, remarks. He, he thought that was irony. He's like, oh, it's irony that you know her larynx wouldn't go down. Like she's still trying to yell at me. But he like mo- he monitored her head like on like the cabinet and was like yelling at it and like <laughs> altercations with it. And then you know, of course, he fucked it. Fuck his mom's head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, trying to train that head. So, so he fucked his own mom's head. Oh yeah, what do you call oh, yeah. that? A mom fucker, I, a motherfucker. I want to say that he fucked her body as well, but I might be I might be making that up. He also he also ate parts as well too from 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 victims. Like he carved off like pieces of their legs and would like cook it in their mac cook it in his macaroni. But I could, couldn't do the breasts. I got too squeamish. I was a little embarrassed. <laughs> right. I'm surprised he didn't eat the butt. Ate the butt. Ate everything. So he knew that one person would be missing his mom, and that was her best friend, Sally Hallett. They called her up? Yeah. After hiding his mom's body parts, he called her up and asked her if she wanted to come over to, for dinner. And she was all excited about that. And she came in, and he strangled her from behind, killed her, chopped her head off, and hid her body in a closet. Fucked her head, too? Oh, yeah. Probably. Yep. He's fucking lots of heads. He leaves a note. And then he he flees the next day. Drove to uh, Pueblo, Colorado. Pueblo? Pueblo. Where on April 23rd, he made a call to the Santa Cruz police to confess his crimes. And at first, the guys didn't believe it. They're like, oh, it's just Big Ed. Just joking. So he had to call back a couple times to like, no, I, I killed my mom and, and I'm the co-ed killer. And so finally, cops went to the house and, and found the body, found the note. And they were like, holy fuck. Okay. How long had he been after? active at this point like how long have they been looking for him they weren't looking for him at all well they were looking for the co-ed killer they're looking for the co-ed killer they're looking for the co-ed killer from like 71 beyond and it's like 70 so like a couple years but also like you said there's so many other killings happening is there's so many other serial killers not to mention other people but obviously herbert mullins i think herbert mullin has like 13 victims yeah, herbert mullin and john lindley frazier like and not to mention who else, you know, there could be other people operating because obviously the Golden State Killer was probably active around that time as well, too. And that dude didn't get caught until like the 2000s. Big Ed was upset because his his neighbor in the pen had more kills than him. He's also the only killer to ever like turn himself in. Like, so that's why he kind of thinks he's the hero in this thing because he's like, yeah, I turned myself in, you know. So they basically said, you know, all right. They informed Colorado police and, you know, they met him at a phone booth. And uh, actually, no, real quick, they took his gun. They're looking for him, the, the co-ed killer, not him. The people knew him at the, the jury room because he used to frequent the bar, the jury room. And, like, he would talk to cops about the killings and stuff. And that's another reason he was able to dodge it because the cops would be openly talk about See the- how close they were getting on yeah. this trail. And they didn't suspect him. So they would openly talk to him. So he was like, you know. He got all this information and knew where to go and where not to go. They sent cops over to see his, uh, to check his gun one time. And when the cops said, like, he got out of his car, he's like, he got out of his car and he got out of his car and he got out of his car because <laughs> he was so big. <laughs> like, he just kept on getting out of his car because he was so big. And he opened his trunk and they gave. Was it a Simpsons episode? 
Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. That big guy. Yeah. The tall ass guy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's basically the same deal. And like, so there, he, the, the young cop was like, cause I guess they drew straws to see he was going to go get Big Ed's gun. And this is before they even thought he was the killer. They just like, he's fucking Big Ed. He's like six, nine, blah, blah, blah. So the guy's like, yeah, get out of his car, get out of his car, get out of his car. Went in the trunk. Why do they take his gun? Because they're trying to run, because they know that Ed's got a, they're looking at registered guns around the area because they're trying to find the co-ed killer. But he said they didn't suspect him. They didn't suspect him, but they're looking at guns. They're just getting, trying to get him off the list, yeah. right? Routinely yeah. checking people's guns. Routine, yeah. And and like, so he was basically thinking, like, oh shit, which gun are they talking about? Because he's got yeah. multiple guns, and like, he gave him the right gun, and it checked out, and he was all set. Um, but so this guy was the same guy who went over to the house when he found, like, after he got the call, and, and found, and he's the one who found the mother and all that stuff like this guy like actually like rose in the ranks as well i forgot the guy's name but so yeah like i said when he gets out of the phone booth they said put the hands up he said his hands were literally on top of the phone booth (laughs) because he's a fucking monster and uh yeah they 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 brought him in and basically he was charged with eight counts of first degree murder because he talked he admitted it he turned himself in so when he was in california and tried in california yeah they they brought him back they brought him back yeah they brought him back to california tried him in california he was charged with eight counts of deg- uh, first degree murder, and he went on trial for his crimes in October 1973. He was found guilty on all charges in early November. When asked by the judge what he thought his punishment should be, Kemper said that he thought he should be tortured to death. Instead, he received eight concurrent life sentences. At present, Kemper is serving his time at California Medical Facility in Vacaville. So it sounded like he did have remorse, like he knew he was a monster. Yep, and so again, of course, like he was definitely created by Clarnell. Not making any excuse for a dude, you know. Obviously, he hit his head too. He had just cut her head off fifteen years before, and all those young girls would have been fine. Yeah, he had over five thousand hours of recording in the booth, in the mic booth. Like what? Like interviews? Yep, interviews. Four million feet of tape. Jeez. Like this dude just loved to talk. He would, he'd like, again, like yeah. he just sung like a canary when they got him. So he was, again, he's got a crazy high IQ. Obviously, a lot of people recognize Ed Kemper from the show Mind Hunter. That's actually kind of what got me into Mind Hunter was seeing the actor who played him. I was like, holy shit, this guy. Right. So legit. And Ed Kemper. He's great. Yeah. Also, he read audiobooks. Oh, that's right. For blind people, right? Didn't he? Uh... No, he re- like he's he just recorded audiobooks. Like he's like he was a narrator for audiobooks. He did Flowers in the Attic. He did The Glass mm-hmm. Key. He did Merlin's Mirror, Petals on the Wind, The Rosemary Murders, Spinks, and multiple Star Wars books. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, in one of the interviews, he does he does something for um for for like a charity thing. Well, because he, he worked for um, the Chamber of Commerce when he was locked up the first time, the Juvie one. Yeah, <laughs> and he did a bunch for blind people. <laughs> if they're still streaming, yeah, I, I'm guessing no, but maybe I don't know if they would just like re- you know I don't know if the book would or the people would spend that much money to like redo the the whole book. So maybe they're like, fuck it, it's there, right? Oh, we don't know. I don't know. I'm not seeing any Ed Kemper books on Audible. Well, oh, well, as far as like the narrator, yeah. I mean, because there was definitely, again, like for sources, I used uh, Edmund Kemper, The True Story of the Co-Ed Killer by Jack Rosewood and Edmund Kemper by Ryan Becker. And they were both very, very short. One of them was like two and a half hours and one of them was like 45 minutes. But that's where most of the information came from. Nate looked at some interviews. Yeah. Right from the source. Yeah. And again, like, no, no matter don't know how true it is. <laughs> yeah, all all his information came from him, you know, so like he mm-hmm. kind of he could have been a lot worse than he than he was and just lied about it cuz you basically got to take So it did he bring order. them he brought them to all the bodies or tried to it? Yeah, he yep, yeah, he basically he you know told them where everything was buried. Obviously they dug up his backyard, found the head. Some bodies were never never discovered because he threw some in the ocean. Yeah, that's the story of Edmund Kemper, the Bumblebutt, the co-ed killer. The Bumblebutt. Now, I I heard, I don't know if this is true, I heard he had a micropenis. Ooh, I heard. Did that come up in any any of your research there? so angry. That's all I I researched was his micropenis, basically. I did like probably 40 (laughs) hours of research on his micropenis. Can't make fun of my penis anymore, Clarnell. (laughs) Yeah, 
No, no, that's what I was going to say. Uh, somebody was linking that to some of the rage. and. Well, if you're 6'9", 300 plus, and you have a micro penis, that sucks. Voices from the Mausoleum is your one-stop shop for everything horror. Join host Scott and Angel as they deep dive into all things horror. From movies, TV shows, books, and video games, nobody is safe. Batten down the hatches, lock your doors, and listen to... Voices from the Mausoleum, another podcast brought to you by the You Run Podcast Network. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. It just defies all, all odds right there. That's no excuse, Ed Kemper. Just because you have him. That's probably why he fucked the mouse and not the neck. Probably like a, <laughs> a living girl virgin. <laughs> Anything else to add on Ed Kemper? He got paroled a bunch of times too, didn't he? He got out. Uh, not that I know of. I think uh, I think he got out like twice. Well, no way, after no, after, after juvie, out. he got out again. Well, yeah, maybe after, um, after juvie, but there's no way he got out after they caught him for eight for eight murders. After I, I want to say after his first killing, he got actually got out again, and uh, and, and the parole people didn't didn't pay much attention to him because they they enjoyed talking to him and and whatnot, and uh, so that he kind of got away out of it. And they just never checked up on him. One fun fact is after he killed, I think it was uh, a Keo Ku, he like had her head in a bag and he went to us like a psych, two psychiatrist appointments on date. <laughs> and they basically said like the psychiatrists were like, oh, like he's grounded. He's normal. Like if, if I would have known about his crimes, like, you know, his grandparents, he's like, I would have never guessed. He seems like a, a good, a good human being. So basically, right. and this is him like at like basically the night after fucking chopping someone's head off and he's got the head in his car. Maybe he was schizophrenic. For sure. Yeah. I think he tried, he tried, he tried to say that, but again, he tried to claim insanity as well, I believe too. And they were like, no, mm-hmm. I don't think I mean, so. but I would think that the, his def- defense would have used that. I think they tried, but again, like with the, you know, his, his, you know, you'd never get out of danger. Yeah, his his crimes, you know, were were planned. You know, obviously he wanted to kill his mom from the start. And like you said, maybe if he had killed his mom early on, not that we're, you know, okay so in that. Executed, right? No, no, he's alive still. He's alive. I thought California had a death penalty. I don't think so. No, actually, why would California? I know where was where was uh, keys. California was usually ahead on all that. So yeah, they probably would have been the first state to have. With Mind Hunter, you know the the show and whatever, like you know he's in that, and, and yeah, Johnny Douglas, the, the author of Mind Hunter, he was like the FBI profiler or whatever. He talked to Ed Kemper a lot, and they he you know basically helped him profile serial killers. Mid to late seventies is when they were using more like analysts like that, or more analysis like that, and seeing what. Yeah, he was very involved with the FBI yeah. and uh, interviews, and just just the psyche of it, of being a killer and well, like said, he said he he, he a, turned himself in but he would always say like you know this happened because so and so did this like he never like really took the blame fully like he always kind of passed the buck and, and tried you know but he thought he was so mm-hmm. righteous because he turned himself in but he was a piece of shit bumble butt he uh he tried to commit suicide twice in prison both times with a pen and uh yeah so so yeah he sharpened it and slit his wrists or whatever and uh, when they asked him about it, he said, uh, the sword is not mightier than the pen or whatever. And no one ever caught on to to what he meant by that. And he always thought that was funny. <laughs> He's like, they're all dumb. I'm so smart. Because the pen was the sword. But obviously, this is a comedy podcast. We're not trying to insult the victims. No, we're just talking about the piece of shit Ed Kemper that he is. And obviously... This podcast contains gruesome stuff, so if you made it through here and you're grossed out, sorry that I had this disclaimer at the end. (laughs) (laughs) This one's getting released after Israel Keys, at least, so, you know, at least they'll know that. I get the disclaimer there. Yeah. Disclaimer, there's a disclaimer. You know, obviously, check us out on yourunpodcast.com. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Pod, YouTube. Instagram, X, all the social medias. Give us a follow. Give us some reviews. Five star reviews. Five star reviews. Give it to us, please. And uh, yeah, right into the show at You Gonna Eat That Crust. 
at gmail.com or gonna eat that crust at gmail.com. The emails just keep on flooding in. Thank you, Nate, for being a special guest. Seamus, thank you. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm glad I could join you guys. Nate, it was good talking with you. Always a pleasure. Hell yeah. Always. Greg, Always. fuck you. Yeah. Disclaimer. <laughs> All right. Everybody have a good night. And remember, in crust, in crust, crust we trust. trust. Later, boys. See ya. Bye.